Coming up, it was Mega Millions Mania, and millions of you spent two bucks on a ticket, but where does your money actually go? Hawley and McCaskill trade barbs in their final debate. Will Yoda and Davids ever get together before Election Day? And how much is the public willing to look past failings in a candidate's biography? Mayoral candidate Quinton Lucas testing the public's appetite for forgiveness this week. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead as we connect the dots on the news of the week in this place we call home, pouring through the Metro's most impactful headlines from KNBC 9 News chief political reporter Michael Mahoney and from 41 Action News reporters Stephen Dial and Kat Reed. And completing the cozy confines of our Week in Review table, Kansas City star, columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling. It was one of the largest jackpots in lottery history. Is it possible that more people in our metro bought a mega million ticket than will ever set foot inside a polling station on election day. According to the Kansas Lottery, more than two and a quarter million tickets were sold for Tuesday's drawing as the prize hit more than a billion dollars. That means there were twice as many lottery tickets sold in the state than ballots cast at the last presidential election in Kansas. What does that tell us, Kat Reed? People want to win money and retire more than they want to vote. Um, but I think one thing that uh, is interesting is not everyone knows exactly where that money is going. Absolutely, which is exactly what I wanted to get into. And I want to do a little <laughs> pop question for you at home and for our panelists. How much, if you're putting down $2 on a Mega Millions ticket, how much of it goes to the state? Uh, no, right. well, a small percentage. A small, a small percentage. percentage. Do you have a sense of how much of that $2? Well, I'm guessing none. None? Okay. No, no, there, there is some money that goes to the state uh, for the lottery, uh, both the Mega Millions and the Powerball, which Kansas and Missouri both have. Uh, I think I read somewhere that the state of Missouri took in about $13 million in revenue from all the tickets that were sold in the Mega Millions drawing that just passed. So that's not uh, insignificant money, but it is not a huge part of uh, the state budgets in either state. It does provide money in Missouri for education. People misunderstand this. Absolutely. And it frees up education money to be spent on well, Let's things. go into that a little bit, because in Kansas, when you throw down that two bucks for a mega millions ticket, actually 57 cents of it goes to the state. And in Missouri, it's actually less, 46 cents going into the coffers there. But for what? Do people really know where the money goes? Do you know off the top of your head where that money goes to? No, I don't. I'd like to know. <laughs> I think this lottery fever is fantastic. Remember, the lottery is for the kids in school. Please make sure somebody check. Make sure the kids get their money. Well, we did check. And actually, if you're in Kansas, nothing goes to schools. Zero. So where does the money go? According to the Kansas Lottery, it goes to juvenile detention facilities, the construction of prisons, and economic development projects aimed at retaining or creating jobs in Kansas. A small amount does go to a problem gambler fund. And if the state rakes in more than $50 million a year, the excess does go into the state general fund. In Missouri, all of the state's share is earmarked for schools, but that includes universities, too. The cash now amounts to 4% of the entire state budget devoted to education. But is that really extra money, or does the state just take the cash they would have spent on schools and put it elsewhere, Michael? The answer to that is yes. And one of the, uh, one of the big fables, especially in the state of Missouri, is the fact that, well, everybody in the lottery tickets are, are providing all those millions of dollars for uh, education, and they are providing millions for education. But the school funds in the state of Missouri and Kansas the budget is billions of dollars, and relatively speaking, it is a small amount that goes into schools and doesn't come anywhere close to funding public education. Well, this week, Claire McCaskill and Josh Hawley debated for the final time before Missouri voters will decide who they want to represent them in the United States Senate for the next five years. That exchange hosted by Channel 9. I have uh, never attacked my opponent personally. I'm not going to, but I have to say, uh, when you hear leaders of the Democrat Party, like Hillary Clinton, saying that you can't be civil with people that you disagree with, when you have Eric Holder, another Democrat leader, saying that 
Uh, the new Democratic Party kicks people who they disagree with. Uh, when you see these mobs popping up in the wake of the Kavanaugh hearings, the screaming, the shouting, driving people out of restaurants, confronting them, this is terrible. You know, it's really interesting to listen to his answer, because did you notice he blamed it all on the Democrats? And I really got to disagree with you. He has spent this entire campaign trying to trash me personally. Just a snapshot of that debate that you produced, Michael Mahoney, over at Channel 9 this week. Uh, did we learn anything new from this exchange? I think we were, uh, learned or they confirmed just how widely apart both these candidates are and their world views are. Uh, yeah, I thought there were some interesting exchanges over the tone of the campaign, uh, which that clip came from. Uh, uh, interesting perspective on uh, Donald Trump. Um, Castle came out and said, I get tired of his lies, his lies, his lies. She used the phrase uh, uh, three times. And then uh, in the citizen uh, uh, session, um, really sort of spun off in two unexpected areas. One, the Project Veritas uh, video, and then uh, uh, Hawley's ray, uh, a role in a uh, human trafficking raid down in Springfield. You know, I was looking at a recent poll in this race, Stephen Dial, and it said 2% of Missourians were undecided in this race, and that was with a plus or minus of uh, 3%. Uh, are there any minds left to change when it comes to a debate like that? Well, I think a lot of the people who tuned in to see Michael Mahoney and all of his glory yesterday um, probably already know what they want to do, but I think- Here's the five bucks now, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think the difference in the debate yesterday was from the St. Louis debate to yesterday, you saw Claire McCaskill really just giving it her all. You could tell that she got tired of holding her tongue and called Josh Hawley a liar multiple times. It's a matter of, well, that boldness and her just saying it all yesterday, well, that hurt her. I th I, I, excuse me for a second, just to amplify on Steve's point here. I think if you would talk to the McCaskill campaign and you talk to uh, Democrats who are plugged in, they would uh, say, McCaskill had a much better, much better performance Thursday night in that debate than she did in St. Louis the week when before. When that was they on public not. television. A fine public television, yes. a okay. fine public television okay. production that I watched yes. with great Absolutely. enthusiasm. Um, the first goal in any debate is to not do something that uh, is so bad that it becomes the focus of stories across the state. Neither candidate uh, made that kind of mistake in this uh, debate. Uh, it was actually a pretty good uh, exchange on substance, thanks to Mike and Chris and the other people over at Channel 9. Um, but I, and, and I agree that Claire McCaskill, by the way, has uh, really picked up her game in the second debate compared to the first. But it's also very clear that she is really tacking to the center as hard as she possibly can. For example, on the questions involving the caravan that's uh, coming up through Mexico, she was full-throated in support of the president, doing whatever he needs to do to protect the borders. And that's a calculated decision that, you know, she has pursued throughout this campaign, but has really grown in the last week, crazy Democrats, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's a gamble because she has to do well in Kansas City and St. Louis. If she doesn't, she'll lose. And she appears to be giving them a secondary place in her strategy as opposed to more rural the, the part, of, part of that, uh, Dave, and I agree, agree with you, I think the calculation there is the, those folks that you just uh, worried about that may, may be in jeopardy uh, by have no place else to go. They're certainly not going Correct. to Correct, and that's her gamble. That's her gamble that those votes can still be gotten. Turnout will well, be incredibly important. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Can't. I was just going to echo that, that I don't think that she she's likely to lose those Democratic voters because they're not going to vote for Holly. So. But there is a Green Party candidate in that race. There's a Libertarian Party candidate in that race. And there's an Independent Party candidate in that race. But we, we, just, yes. Just briefly, <laughs> yeah. Just briefly. African-American votes in St. Louis and Kansas City are critical for any Democrat. Claire McCaskill has struggled with that for a year. And again, instead of making sort of an overt attempt to get more urban votes, she really turned more rural in the last couple of weeks. It's a gamble. It may work if she can get that kind of turnout in country areas. With a little more than a week before Election Day, with tens of thousands of Kansans already casting ballots in early voting, is the only race where you won't see a bait this year in the Kansas 3rd Congressional District after lots of public squabbling over the issue? Will Kevin Yoder and Sharice Davids ever share a stage together at any point before Election Day? I know you've been working on this, Dave. Well, we're still working on it, and we worked on it this morning and visited with Sharice Davids, and we are making every attempt to try and put them together before uh, the election on November 6th. But 
it's extraordinarily difficult. It's like <laughs> negotiating the end of World War I. <laughs> and the reality is that this debate could have happened and should have happened weeks ago. But because of political calculations from both sides, it hasn't. I hope so. Does it really matter, though, Can't Reid? This is something that I've been talking a lot about with some colleagues. You know, who really cares who's most impacted by this? And I think at this point, David's is leading in all of the polls that we've seen. I just don't think at this point she has that much of a motivation to do it because, um, you know, that's just where things stand. Well, I, I, I think she has nothing to lose by not debating. I don't think they'll debate. I know they're working hard. I think the only way you'll see them on stage together is put some cutouts on the stage. I um, disagree on this. I think, and not privy to the inside of, uh, of the star, I would not be surprised if this comes together at the last minute. Uh, I think uh, the Yoder campaign may decide they want to do this enough. David's has already agreed to the Star and WDAF to, uh, debate. This, this, this might happen. There are lots of reasons why Sharice Davids does not want to debate, including the one that she is not very good on thinking on her feet. Yeah. Let me just say that we've been talking with both campaigns for some time. We think we have agreement to do something next week and dates proposed. The question is, what is the format, how late in the cycle, and whether, frankly, uh, we can get it on television, whether television reporters will be allowed in. Those details are still in yes flux. And on all of those yes. things, well, here's the important thing. On all of those things, the negotiations could collapse. And so the likelihood of it happening, I, I, you know, 25, 30 percent, but we're trying. We're trying. Well, lots of attention has been paid to the Missouri Senate race, the governor's race in Kansas, and yes, this Yoda Davids race. Every member of Congress from our area is up for re-election. When Kansas Second District Congresswoman Lynn Jenkins announced in January she wouldn't even seek re-election, it set off a political scramble to fill her shoes. It's now down to three candidates, including Paul Davis, who took on Sam Brownback four years ago, and former Army Ranger Steve Watkins. I traveled to Topeka to moderate their first televised debate this week. Fellow Republicans have called my opponent Steve Watkins a liar, a fraud, and a rank opportunist. He hasn't lived in Kansas for over 20 years. He doesn't own a home here. He hasn't paid taxes here. Together, let's pause to remember that although we have our differences, we are Americans first. What divides us is not as great as what unites us. America is the greatest country in the world. I just want to keep it that way. The problem we have today is that current representatives choose to represent their party instead of their constituents. It is time to clean the muck out of the swamp and get rid of the ones who represent themselves. All righty, you can see that debate Sunday at 5 here on KCPT. The Kansas 2nd Congressional District really covers a lot of our broadcast area. If you're in Kansas and you don't live in Johnson or Wyandotte or Miami County just to the south, who wins this seat will be your congressman. What's at stake in this race, Michael? Um, control, uh, Republican control of a district that they think ought to be in their pocket. And uh, because of the geography that you just mentioned, Nick, uh, this thing does stretch from Nebraska down to Oklahoma. It's got Topeka in and they, that, that sort of thing. This is a district that they feel that they ought to keep, and they're very concerned about it. We see all these ads all of the time, but not everybody understands what this district is and what it means, Kat. Yeah, well, it's an extremely important district, but one thing that I wanted to point out about it is that uh, the GOP has been very lukewarm about Watkins. He does not have full-hearted support there. Um, they want a Republican in that seat, but it's not a candidate that the infrastructure that the establishment is very excited about. But, but he was galvanized by having the president come to town just recently in support of him, along with Chris Kobach. It was, and it was a much-needed shot in the arm for his campaign. But again, you know, talking to people, depending on what county you're in, a lot of people still are on the fence about him, especially Republicans who want a Republican to be in that seat. Yeah, just briefly, I checked this morning. Independent spending in the second district race is about $11.1 .1 million. Those are the third party ads, Congressional Leadership Fund and others. That greatly exceeds the independent spending in the third district, Yoder David's race. That's in part because I think national Republicans think control of the House may depend on races, not just the David's Yoder race, but really the Watkins uh, Davis race, because it is a, a, a seat, as Mike suggests, that Republicans kind of count on. If they lose it, they may be in jeopardy of losing their majority in Washington. And that's why all of that money is pouring into the district and ending up on their television screens. <laughs> just, just, just to amplify, amplify on that point, $11 million 
in that district, oh. in the television markets of that district, which are Topeka and St. Joseph, and, or uh, Topeka and uh, St. Joseph to some degree, Pittsburgh, but Joplin, Joplin, yeah. Joplin um, are relatively small markets. Eleven million bucks is a huge amount of money. Uh, and that's you know, outside spending, Nick. That's that doesn't count spending, what right. the two candidates are spending at all. Why is it that we don't also hear about Emmanuel Cleaver? He's running for re-election. Vicki Hartzler on the Missouri side running for re-election. Sam Graves running for re-election. I don't see their ads on 41 Action News and KNBC 9 News when I'm in the commercial break. Actually, uh, Graves is, out, is, up, is yeah. now up. On, uh, on TV, this is a function of the fact that uh, the races are not that competitive, and that the uh, incumbents on this, Hartzler and Cleaver and Graves, are considered uh, heavy favorites. For several years now, there's been a debate over showing picture ID at the polls. Opponents say it blocks vulnerable populations from voting. Advocates say it's about maintaining the integrity of the system. And if you need a photo ID to board a plane or cash a check, shouldn't you expect to do the same when you cast a ballot? While that remains a divisive issue, the state of Kansas making national news for so limiting the number of places residents can vote, they've made it almost impossible. At the heart of this latest dispute is Dodge City, Kansas, which has just moved its one and only polling station outside the city limits and at a facility more than a mile from the nearest bus stop. The fact that the town is 60 percent Hispanic is adding to the indignation. County officials, though, say there's no malice here. A road construction project forced the temporary moving of the polling place. So is the city being unfairly targeted for being insensitive in all of these national stories, Dave Helling? N no. Th they should make it easier to vote, not harder, if there is a construction project uh, that interferes with the traditional polling place, make it, uh, move it to a place that's much more convenient. The idea you have to move out of town to cast a ballot in a community is ridiculous. And, but they uh, say there's, a, there's advanced voting, you can cast a mail-in ballot, and they're also offering free bus service now still, for anyone who wants to vote yeah, and can't get there. It is still too hard to vote in this country, and Dodge City is making it harder to vote for some people, and they should be ashamed for doing the so. The optics of this are horrific are just absolutely horrific and when the uh, school superintendent out there offers up use some of our buildings and it, it doesn't happen the optics are awful and you did point out the free transportation to the polls but you have to schedule your ride in advance so that that's just another layer of complication there are some other groups coming in trying to help with this there is um, a heavily hispanic group that's partnering with lyft to provide transportation to the polls but um, the optics are just really bad regardless of what the intention was and there are many places in this country where there is only one polling place uh, where you get to vote in in some reasonably decent sized towns that's right and Photo ID is a whole nother discussion, and Kat and I can probably talk to you after about just uh, us being new people here and registered to vote. And I know myself, I experienced a hurdle with my photo ID, and I think when it comes to that, it's also education with poll workers and knowing what the actual law is and how it's enforced. How much is the public willing to look past failings in a candidate's biography? Kansas City Councilman and mayoral candidate Quinton Lucas is testing the public's appetite for forgiveness this week. Uh, and then once I saw that I needed to get out of the situation that I was in, wanted to separate myself from it. And I continue to believe that ultimately made a responsible choice and made a legal one. Lucas was arrested in Lawrence on suspicion of operating a vehicle under the influence and booked into the county jail in Douglas County. Along with serving on the city council, he is a lecturer at KU Law School. He says he was at an event and drank alcohol, but decided to wait in his car until it was safe for him to drive. He claims he didn't move the car, never shifted a gear, never released a parking brake. Is this going to cost him in his race for mayor, or is the nature of this incident such he likely get a pass from voters? You actually spoke with him, and that was part of your interview with him this week, Kent. Yes, I did. He seemed very calm during the interview. He very much believes that this is going to be dismissed. That's related to a couple of uh, Supreme Court and Court of Appeals decisions that kind of debate what is operating a vehicle. Does the car actually have to move for that to be uh, uh, operating under the influence? Um, I think that even though even if this is dismissed, you still have the matter of that mugshot out there, which is just not great for any candidate. So I think that that makes it challenging for him moving forward. I think that already, though, we've seen a lot of support between Councilman Jolie Justice. It, we still have a lot of time left to go in this race, but I don't know if necessarily he is the favorite currently in the mayoral race. Some people are asking uh, if he was trying to stay in the car 
because he'd drunk so much alcohol, how long was he really willing to stay in that car? It takes about five and a half hours, I think, from health experts to go from a blood alcohol level that is at the legal limit to be safe to drive. Was he really be willing to sit in that car for five and a half hours? Well, a lot of people are, are just questioning it altogether. And I talked to multiple law enforcement agencies, uh, just on a, on a personal and in an official capacity in multiple counties. And they told me that if you're sitting behind the wheel uh, in the driver's seat that is operating is how officers uh, perceived the law. And uh, I talked to one officer who said a person was sitting in the car to sober up. They were in the passenger seat and they couldn't ticket them. So it, it, It's an intent thing, isn't it, Steve, in the eyes of some <coughs> law, uh, law, uh, law enforcement officials, I intent to drive? Right. They're saying, uh, and this is just from what officers have told me, if you're sitting behind the vehicle, that's operating. Even if the car is not on, which on the scanner that we heard, it said that the vehicle was running. If you're sitting behind the driver's seat, that's operating and that's how officers are perceiving the law. Uh, and this is America, Dave Helling, the Thank land you. of uh, second chances. Don't yes. people like people who are flawed and then come back from that? Yeah, I mean, it, it knocks uh, Quentin Lucas off his stride a little bit, but I think by election day next year, this will be baked into whatever calculation we make. Had it happened two weeks before Election Day, the calculus is completely different, even the exact same incident. The distance from Election Day, I think, again, gives people a chance in Kansas City to absorb it and deal with it. But, you know, if you ask Quentin Lucas today, would you have preferred this not have happened, right. he would have said, of course. It, it, it does knock him off his stride, and, and for that reason, it's important. Paseo Boulevard is one step closer to becoming Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, the city planning committee unanimously passing a measure this week to approve the change after months of lobbying by a coalition of black religious and political leaders. The mayor wanted other ideas. His own task force recommended that the new KCI terminal be named after Dr. King. Does this decision this week close the door on that, Stephen Dial? I think. The council members at, at past committee unanimously, and I've been talking to them, they're dead set on the Paseo. I heard 63rd Street was also uh, a proposal. This has been interesting. It's been going back and forth. I think they just need to just do a vote, deal with it, if it's going to happen or not. It's not going to be the airport terminal, I don't think. It's going to be a road, but a lot of people that I've been talking to in this community are saying, why don't you name it after a numbered street? Name it after a street that goes through both parts of town, but it's not already having an established name. Can't. And there was some controversy with the mayor's group that recommended the terminal, because if you ask the people as part of that group, they said, we want the airport named after MLK. And so there's this back and forth where then the mayor said, well, no, they're just talking about the terminal. And those people kind of contested that. So how big of a a symbolic gesture that would be then became a source of debate. So that's why I think that the Paseo has gathered so much support. I you know, really you know, cannot. Nick, I, just real quickly, I would not rule out 63rd Street. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's the horse on the outside of the, uh, the race at this point, but I wouldn't rule that out as a compromise. No, I, I don't like going through the same issue over and over again on this program, so I was hoping with this vote this week this would now put an end to it, but you don't see that, Michael. I think the 63rd Street is a viable option. I wouldn't, I don't think it's dead yet. There was also the question of the fact that this was going to cost $50,000, plus you needed to have 75% uh, of homeowners living along a street to actually approve it before a name change yeah could take place. Right. A couple things. First of all, much more than $50,000. Yeah. It's closer to $750,000 was the amount of money set aside in the uh, ordinance on the east side. It's uh, pretty expensive because the street lights need or street signs need to be lit and some other things. And the people on the street aren't real enthusiastic yeah. about it. There is a 75% approval requirement in city codes. That has been waived in the ordinance that's now before the council. Uh, I think Mike is right. Some of the other uh, uh, options are still on the Table, but I get a sense from the council members that they really want to put this behind them, that, that it's been going on for a year, it's more divisive than it needs to be. I think in the end, particularly the unanimous vote in committee suggests that the votes are there to do, uh, do the Paseo. While we've been concentrating on the latest political stories on this program, so much else happening in the news this week. The Kansas City Police Department facing tough questions as a police van kills a Shawnee Mission South High School student on his way to the Chiefs game. Messages of support pouring in from around the world for an Independence 13-year-old. A viral video captures him being bullied and a gun pointed to his head. Is it the end or the latest chapter in an ongoing smelly saga? The state of Missouri temporarily halts expansion of a cattle feedlot near Powell Gardens. And just weeks after Shake Shack opens on the plaza, 
get ready for more long lines to get in, this time in Johnson County as the super-hyped New York burger chain plans a second location at Town Center Plaza in Leewood. Was one of these your most significant non-election story of the week, or was it something else, Kent? I think absolutely the bullying video. I had people, journalists from other cities, reaching out to me saying, hey, did you see this? Have you guys covered it? It was huge on social media, uh, the comments that we got. I think that that really was the story. Kids, kids are bullied all of the time everywhere, including <sighs> in Kansas and Missouri. This made it different because you actually saw it in a visual face, right? Well, and it was so violent. I mean, having, having a gun in a bull bullying situation, I think it was how extreme it was that really stood out. Stephen. The bullying video as well, he was on one of the local radio stations this morning. They gave him tickets to wrestling and, and, thing like that, and things like that. Seeing it on social media is a, a different realm and actually seeing it up front and close. And then also we can't forget about the Price Chopper shooting on, on off of Bannister Road. An eight-year-old went home uh, Thursday with two bullets still in her stomach and we don't know who the shooter Reconfirming was. why we're still the fifth most violent city in America. Uh, Michael Mahoney. Nick, I'll offer up something that wasn't on, on that list, and that is the uh, the reaction in Kansas City, Kansas, to the guilty plea that came this week to uh, the fatal shooting of an officer over there. The police department, the mayor, uh, the family of uh, Officer Melton, and others are irate about this. Dave Helming. I, was, uh, I attended this week a meeting of the committee that's deciding how to spend the east side sales tax that was passed by voters in 2017. Twenty four million dollars worth of requests were revealed for an eight million dollar fund. It's astonishing the optimism, the entrepreneurial spirit on the east side. People really want to fix the community. That's an underreported story. Thank this you week. for allowing us to end on a positive yes. note. That is our weekend review. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.